So, many years ago, it's becoming many years ago, when I was in college, <laughs> uh, I had an experience where I got to, um, I, it was a, it was a internship, a, a college internship, and it took me to Orlando, Florida, where I worked for Walt Disney World uh, for about six months. And a uh, little piece of trivia, some of you don't know about me, I drove the boat and I spieled on the Jungle Cruise. <laughs> they were looking for somebody who liked to talk and, you know. <laughs> you know, it, it, was a, it was quite an experience in my life as I, as I look back on that. I remember certain um, expectations that I had and things that I was looking forward to. I, I just, um, in college, I really wanted to travel and I wanted to, um, I just wanted to understand different cultures and um, so this really appealed to me and so I, I signed up for this, this program and there went, I went through this interview process. They hire so many college students per year. They travel around the country and interview on different campuses and and uh, anyway, I, I went through the whole deal, and uh, as the Lord would have it, I made the cut, and so they hired me, and so off I went to Orlando, and I lived. Part of what appealed to me is I, I would, the way they pitched this whole thing is you get to live with roommates from all over the world. Well, that was, that to me was the whole reason I wanted to go. <laughs> and um, at that time, I was a business major, hadn't made up my mind yet, and so like a lot of college students, I said, well, this you know, declare business kind of a thing. And uh, it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do, but it was something, you know. And so, um, so I went with this, just this excitement to meet all these people from around the world. I was going to live with five roommates, all from different countries. And so I show up and they put us in these, um, these condos, these brand new nice condos. And what you do is, is they give you a job and you work in the parks, either at Magic Kingdom or MGM Studios or Epcot Center. And, and so you uh, go to class in the morning and you learn about Disney and their whole business model and what makes them successful and all of that sort of thing. And, and then you go and you work in, in the parks in these different capacities. And, and so that was the plan. Well, I get there, and yes, I have five roommates. No, they are not from all parts of the world. Every last one of them was from Boston. <laughs> That's good. It's a small world. <laughs> so... I'm getting to know these guys, and you know, they all seem nice enough. They're, you know, pretty fun-loving guys. But as it would turn out, they ended up to be not so fun to me because they all just loved to party. See, I was, in, I was in Florida to get this whole educational experience, this cultural experience. They were in Florida for one reason of their own, too, and it was to party and to meet girls and, you know, do what, you know, college students do in Florida. You know, it's like spring break, you know, and... Fort Lauderdale or whatever, same kind of a scene. And so, <laughs> so I remember praying, Lord, I, I really want to just be a, a witness, a good witness to these, these guys. And so um, that was what I set out to do. And I, I, I did okay for a while. But I started to, to just get bothered by certain things. It was just so over the top that it just grated on my spirit. Every day I'd come, I'd come home at night from work and they'd have a party going on and they'd be playing quarters and people are just, you know, falling down drunk. And it just was this funny thing to them. And, you know, I grew up around all that stuff. So I'm not naive about, you know, the ways of the world. It's not like I grew up in uh, a sheltered home or anything like that. So it's, it's, it, it wasn't that for me that was such a, it wasn't a shocker to me. It was just disappointing. You know, I just had some other things in mind that I wanted to do while I was there. And, and so I thought, well, okay, I'll just work with this. And <laughs> they need Jesus, you know. <laughs> and so, so this went on. But then it just got more blatant. And they, they put up this banner that said the Betty Ford Club. And underneath this on the wall, and this is what you walk into every day. You see all these Polaroids of them puking over the toilet. 
And, and so it was just this in your face, we're proud of what we're doing, we think it's funny, and it just was always, and then they started to razz me because, you know, I'm the guy with the Bible on the nightstand and the goody two-shoes and Mr. Christian, you know, and, uh, and I didn't push anything on anybody. I was just, you know, just doing my thing, praying for them. And, uh, and then another day I came in and my roommate, you know, had a girl over and so I kind of just dealt with that, you know, and it was just one of those things, just one thing after another that just grated on me. But the real kicker, here's where it got really ugly. They started stealing my milk. <laughs> So we had our shelves, you know, in the fridge. And uh, I mean, I went through college having all kinds of roommates and I never had a problem with this before. But these guys decided that it was gonna be kind of funny to see if they could push my buttons. And so they started just stealing my milk. I'd get this new jug of milk, I'd come home and it'd be gone. And for a while, I'm just, you know, kind of taking it on the chin. But man, it just wore on me and wore on me and wore on me. And finally, I got so mad this one, <laughs> I'm so ashamed of this, it's a bad deal. So I, I, I figured out who it was and um, he was about this tall <laughs> and I didn't care. And uh, so I went and I confronted him and I tried to be respectful and nice, but you know, they started doing this thing where they were just, um, they'd just lie and then they'd kind of taunt and laugh at each other and look at each other. and. And so there was a bit of mild persecution, you might call it, that's going on. And in my mind, I'm just thinking, that's it, I've had it. And so I get into it with this guy and we start exchanging words and I literally threaten him with bodily harm. No kidding, I mean, it was just pathetic. I was so mad and I am not an easy, I do not get riled up, it's not how I roll at all. But I had just gone over the side, I mean, and I was not coming back. <laughs> and so, he finally kind of backed off and, and mellowed out. And I, but the whole time, it's like the Holy Spirit is going, John, shut up. You know, <laughs> you know how you just know the Holy Spirit, you're, you're just going the wrong way fast, buddy. And it just went from bad to worse. And, um, and I am just, to my shame, I, all, he, we walked, we parted away, but I'll never forget the look on his face. He, he just, it was like he couldn't believe I was actually threatening him. And so I went away and the Lord just worked on my heart and convicted me to the point where I realized I have to apologize to this guy. And I'm thinking, there ain't no way I'm apologizing to him, Lord. And I went through that wrestling match and then finally the Lord kind of just got my attention and I decided to do it. <clears throat> and to no credit of my own. I'm not bragging about that at all. Like I said, to me, this is just a, was such a, uh, just a, an embarrassing thing. And, uh, but I did apologize to him and I'll never forget the look on his face. He just looked at me like, yeah, okay, whatever. But it was this look of disappointment, sort of that it was like I was reminded of what so often I've, I've said to you, you know, even non-Christians know how Christians should act. And it was like I destroyed my witness. And it was like the Lord let me just kind of deal with that. I was hoping it would end and we'd all live happily ever after. You know, there'd be this reconciliation and then I could get back to witnessing. <laughs> no, it just, it just kind of, it mellowed out after that. But it was not a victory, I'll tell you that much. It was just one of those things that I went away just feeling like, man, I really blew that. And, and I couldn't get it back. I mean, the damage was done. And, and I learned then, I, I, as I thought about that, what we're gonna talk about tonight, relationships, a mess worth making, the theme that I wanna talk through with you is the idea of agendas. Do you know God has an agenda for your life? He really does. He, he has an agenda for my life and, and he puts people in our lives and, and they're not always gonna people, be people we get along with and you know, and, and what I just described that story, maybe some of you have similar stories and just that the bitter pill it is to swallow when you realize, man, I can't get that back. I really blew that. Now there's, there's hope, there's forgiveness, there's grace for all of that. And I'm thankful for God's grace. I know I'm forgiven. I, but it was one of those tough lessons. It, it's just, I look back and it's a sober reminder of how quickly I can just go off the rails spiritually. And here's how it happens. When I 
am writing a different script, when I have a different agenda for my life than God has. There's nothing wrong with the fact that I, that I had a desire for this cultural experience, that I had a desire to redeem the time and get the most out of that whole situation, that I had, uh, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with those desires, but those desires became sinful demands to the point where that I was willing to destroy my witness in order to get what I wanted, you see? In order, and it came down to something as silly and trivial as milk. Talk about don't cry over spilled milk. I mean, I was doing this in spades. And so, so um, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, he said, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Now, in that context, he said, you can't serve both God and money, but the principle, you understand, that's not just dealing with stewardship of money. Our whole lives is a steward, are a stewardship, right? Everything we have, all the opportunities, all the relationships, all of it is a stewardship from God. And he says, now I want you to manage this well for my, for my glory. And, and when I have a different agenda than God, then I start managing those things for my glory. And I just say and do stupid things that I eventually will regret. And, and that was just, to me, just a stellar example of what not to do <laughs> as I look back at that story. And like I said, there's grace for it. Um, uh, I, I've, I mentioned to you before, to me, shame is like an uncomfortable friend. <laughs> you know, it, it, in the sense that God just will remind me of things, not to because he's condemning me or he wants me to wallow in the past or any of that. It's just sort of this little reminder that says, John, if it happened once, it can happen again. So when I think about that story and I feel ashamed, it's like the Lord saying, John, you know you're forgiven. That's not the point. And I don't want you to go forward beating yourself up or any of that. But you are capable of doing that same thing Anytime, even after all these years, do you ever surprise yourself after decades of walking with the Lord and, and in some relationship, someone pushes your buttons or something happens and exposes the idol in your heart and you end up saying and doing stuff, you're just ashamed. You go, Lord, am I back here again? Really, have I not grown at all? And he's like, oh, yeah, you've grown, but you do still have a sinful nature and you need me as much today as your savior and your redeemer as you ever have. Say, okay, Lord, and it's so humbling to go through that. I'm going to read some statements to you, and I want to see if you can pick out the underlying agenda, okay? Now, these are happy statements, and there's nothing wrong per se with these statements, okay? So I'll, I'll make that disclaimer, but just listen to this. Maybe you've said some of these things. I've said all of these things practically. I'm so happy we don't argue like we used to. I just love being with you. I'm enjoying the time I'm spending with my family. I'm so thankful for my friends. You've been so good to me. It's great to know that I found someone I can truly trust. We're such kindred spirits. It's wonderful how our personalities are so complementary. This has been fun. Let's get together again. Before I met you, I was so lonely. It's great we have known each other for so long. We've had so many nice times together. We've had our problems, but we've always been able to work through them. Who wouldn't want to be able to say these things, right, about any of our relationships? It all seems good. <clears throat> but what is the agenda in each of these statements? That's right. It's what the person gets out of the relationship, right? Right? And for, for all of us as self-centered people, this, this agenda for personal happiness is very, very seductive, isn't it? Sin always drives us or draws us towards self-interest. It's, it's possible that even in our most generous moments that we are driven by what we get out of them. And, and scripture, what scripture has to say about this is, is so unique. Uh, in fact, there are two themes that I think we see over and over again in the scripture. Number one, the power of self-interest is still present in the believer, in the believer. We still have this present in us. While the control of sin has been broken, the sin that remains in us still puts up a real fight, doesn't it? 
And so what this means is while we are here, we cannot fully escape the power and the presence of self-interest. It will remain a reality even in the best relationships. In fact, check this out. The more satisfying the relationship, the less conscious you will be of self-interest. Think about that. The most destructive diseases are the ones that don't show themselves in obvious ways. It's true of, of spiritual maladies as well. But number two, another theme that dominates in Scripture is that God has a bigger re, uh, agenda for relationships than we do. The default question all of our lives in every relationship should be what is God's purpose? What is God's design? What is his reason for creating this? And when we apply those kinds of questions to relationships, we begin to see just how different God's agenda is for our relationships than ours is. We would easily settle for our own definition of personal happiness when God's purpose is so much more. God's purpose is nothing less than conforming us to the image of Christ. Hmm. I think of uh, Romans 8.28. It's important to read 8.29 as well. God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love him or the called according to his purpose. Keep reading that we might be conformed to the image of his son, see? And whether we're conscious of it or not, we all have dreams for our relationships and we're always working to realize those dreams. How close is your dream to God's purpose? That's the question. And so this is what we wanna look at today. We, we all live somewhere between God's dream and our dream. And the best thing we can do is just become more conscious of which one is ruling. Now I wanna give you a scriptural template for this, okay? So open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter four. We're gonna go through this very quickly in some kind of large chunks, about three different chunks of this passage of scripture. And so um, it's, it's gonna be kind of a roadmap to this bigger agenda that God has. But as you read it, ask yourself what it says about, first of all, the struggle of self-interest and secondly, God's agenda for our relationships. I think it can be sort of a grid uh, that we use to look at relationships as we move along in our study on the subject. As you consider the passage, think about your relationships. Why do we get angry, for example? Uh, why are we impatient? Uh, why uh, do we fail to be kind and gentle? Why do we hold a grudge or act out of vengeance? Uh, why do we refuse to cooperate or say things that we uh, never should say? Why do we walk away in disgust with one another at times or lie or seek to manipulate? Why are we envious of others or competitive? Why do we struggle to rejoice at another person's blessings? These kinds of questions. Well, we do all of these things uh, for one reason. We want our way in the way that we've chosen at the time that we deem best. As someone once said, we love us and have a wonderful plan for our lives. <laughs> All right, we have a dream, and the problem is it's not the Lord's dream. Now, I want you to see this call to unity in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 1. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And what, what Paul does um, is he gives us sort of this, um, he applies well, he talks about grace in relationships, and then he comes to, to four, and then he basically applies it to relationships. In verse one, he says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. So you're a recipient of grace, and, and your life is supposed to reflect that, and mine is too. And specifically, he says it needs to show up in your relationships with other people in the body of Christ. Is there a sense of unity you can't take the gospel seriously if you don't take relationships seriously. And, and the first thing that he says is maintain the unity of the spirit. Keep the unity of the spirit. Notice he says maintain. He doesn't say create. Is there any disunity in the Trinity? Of course not. And so it's supposed to be in the body of Christ. There's, there's no disunity among the persons of the Trinity. He says, now you keep that. 
Maintain that. Guard that. You are united to one another because you're united to Christ. And because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you already share this deep bond that's been given to you by grace. That's why it's, it's so um, wonderful and sometimes surprising how quickly you can bond just with other believers. You know, you can go to another country and run into believers and it's like instantly there's a connection. That's a gift of God's grace. Why? Because of the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. It's a supernatural thing. And so, so these relationships are gifts to be managed with great care. And I'm either being a good steward or a bad steward of these gifts. If I hinder my relationship with other believers in any way, think about your relationship with other believers at Calvary Chapel, in the body of Christ. If you hinder those relationships, you're devaluing those relationships. That's why it is such a dangerous thing and such a hurtful thing to the body of Christ if when you have conflict with other believers, you just go take your toys and play somewhere else. That's it, I'm not going to this church. These people don't care about me, you know? And, and a lot of Christians go off in a huff and when they get hurt, like they've expected the church to be somehow, uh, you know, free from sin and sinners. Now, I'm not excusing or justify any kind of, you know, we shouldn't be careless about sinning against one another. But I, I have this growing deep appreciation for people in my life that I've had conflict with in different ways over the years in, in ministry. And, and, I, and yet, here we are, 20, almost 30 years together, and we're still together. It's just the grace of God. That's the only way you can explain it because they love Jesus and I love Jesus and, and, and we just keep at it. And you know, we're starting to see fruit of that in some pretty wonderful ways. We're seeing how God is blessing those relationships, blessing the ministry. And it's a wonderful thing when people are more committed to Jesus and his agenda than their own personal comfort. And, and happiness. And, and I'll tell you, God has so much more in store uh, if, we, if we just persevere in the Lord. And we have to pursue and forgive and serve and demonstrate in the process we care about this thing called unity. We really, really do. But then he says, make every effort. And that's the kicker, isn't it? That's where the rub comes. Paul is not naive about the hard work that relationships require. He knows that relationships, even among people who have the spirit, will not be easy. Have you noticed how distasteful and unsatisfying and uninteresting relationships suddenly become when they require work? <laughs> it could be just getting along swimmingly until all of a sudden you disagree about something. And then it's like, ugh, I could do without you. <laughs> You know, all of a sudden, this person that you say you love, you say you care about, you say you have or have been friends with all these years, all of a sudden, it's like you just, ah, it's just not worth the effort. We see it all the time. How many marriages have suffered because neither husband or wife had a biblical work ethic for their relationship? Paul says, we find excitement and satisfaction within the context of hard work, but most of us give up when we decide that the, 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 the dividend isn't worth the investment. Sadly, we, we frequently uh, have a different way of accounting than God does. Our own personal interests is the interests we care about instead of God's call. Notice the next phrase, though. Be humble, gentle, patient, and forbearing in love. Paul leads with character qualities that are the opposite of what often drive our relationships. And did you notice this? It's important to note these are character qualities before they are ever actions. They're character qualities before they're ever actions. Humility is what enables us to see our own sin before we focus on the sin and weakness of another person. Do you hold others to a higher standard than you do yourself? A gentle person is, is not weak. A gentle person is someone who uses their strength to empower someone else. A gentle person can use strength without damaging those whom he's trying to help. Do people regularly feel bruised in their relationship with you? A patient person is someone who places the needs of others higher than his or her own needs, or at least at the same level. They don't come with their selfish agenda. A forbearing person is someone who does all of this even when provoked. So patient, gentle, 
forbearing and humble? Do you love people with limits? Driven by your own perceived needs or interests? Do others feel they must always return the favor to keep you happy with them? See, these character qualities of being humble and gentle and patient, etc., they this is the these are the things that create a climate for grace in a relationship. These very things. And, and we may not live aware of this, but we tend, to, we tend to operate with a set of rules, unspoken rules, that we expect other people in our lives to abide by. And I'm watching to make sure you follow my rules. <laughs> it's such a contradiction, though, of the gospel. It, it prevents the glory and the worth of God's grace from showing itself in your relationships. And this is the opposite of what Paul says should be true of those who've received grace. Freely we receive, freely we need to give. And he says there's one spirit, one Lord, and one Father. So he grounds this unity in the unity of the uh, Trinity. Notice he doesn't ground it in our personal ability to get along. It doesn't depend on our compatibility or our ability at all. Amazing, Jesus humbled himself The Father gently and patiently works out our salvation. The Holy Spirit forbears and abides with us even in the face of our sin, convicting and correcting us, but never condemning us. And see, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit were torn apart. Why? So that we could be united. It's an amazing thing to think about. And this kind of relational integrity is a high calling, but but the God who has commanded us to live this way also gives us everything we need to fulfill it. And these relationships, though, we have to be all in and say, you know what, this is a priority. Now I wanna talk about the appreciation next in the next section of diversity. There's this call of unity in the first part, but then in the next part, Um, I'm going to read through that section. It's kind of long, but just hang with me. It says, but to each one of us, verse seven, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descends is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service. So that, listen, the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and here it is, become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunningness and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, here we go, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And so because it is grounded in the Trinity, our unity also allows us to celebrate diversity. There's unity in diversity and vice versa. And all of this is what makes possible our growth in grace. So diversity from God's point of view is not an obstacle. The fact that everybody's so different from me, men are so different from women, you know, and, and, and we need to celebrate those differences and realize God did that on purpose. In the body of Christ, there's so many differences. God did that on purpose. That's the very context in which his grace can be on display. It is not an obstacle. It is a very significant means to an end. God's using that diversity. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Notice that. And so all these differences that exist among us, we have different gifts, we serve in different capacities in the body of Christ, and we're at various levels of maturity, and all of it is there by God's apportionment, his sovereign uh, apportionment. And, and he, he chooses to surround us with people who are different because he knows that it will promote his purpose. And yet so often, the minute we face that kind of stuff, we get all upset about it, perplexed by it, 
and we tend to push away. God says, no, don't do that. You want to draw closer. Draw closer to people. Don't run and push away from people. Draw closer. And then he says, so that the body of Christ may be built up. In verses 12 to 16, we see his purpose. Over and over again, Paul argues that our relationships are valuable because God has a purpose for them. Whenever we try to give our relation, whenever we try to give our relationships purpose, we become impatient. See, that's what I was doing in Florida. I was trying to give those relationships purpose, wasn't I? I said, well, here's what I'm going to do. And I had good intentions. I did. They were noble intentions. It's just God had a different agenda. He wanted to use those things to just reveal something in me that I, I like to think I love people who are different than me. I, I like to think I love lost people who don't know Jesus and simply live like they don't know Jesus. Rather than having compassion, I was a big fat jerk. It's, it's, I just totally lost it. Why? Because I was trying to give those relationships a purpose that God didn't have at that time at least not in that way. He, I, he was exposing me and he says, you know, John, you, you're gonna need to learn how to love people that are hard to love. And it's easy to love people. Jesus said, hey, you've heard that it's been said to love. He says, I say to you, love even your enemies. It's easy to love people who love you. It's hard to love people that don't. And our purpose is so often to get what we want. God's purpose is, is to give us what we really need. And he wants the things that rule Christ's heart to rule our heart as well. And this is where the true value of relationships runs so counter to what we normally think. We think things are going well only if we're getting along with others. But God says, hey, even when we're not getting along with others, God's still accomplishing his purposes. Are, are, are you able to uh, give God that, that leeway to work in those situations? And, and if you quit at the first sign of, of fatigue when you exercise, some of you may be, in, you know, you're exercising, but you don't love it. <laughs> but you know that there's a purpose in it. And if you quit just because you get tired or it gets hard, then you miss the chance to become more fit, to become stronger. And if this is true of physical, our physical bodies, how much more in the body of Christ? How much more in our spiritual lives? And God has designed, listen, God has designed our relationships to function in a twofold way. On one hand, they diagnose our heart problem. And at the same time, those relationships are part of God's cure. He actually uses those people in your life to bring about the change of heart that God wants to see. Every time you are willing to learn to love someone that's hard to love, you're becoming more like Jesus. And, and it's amazing the transformative effect that it has many times in that person's life when they see that you're gonna love them unconditionally, see? And, uh, and so we so often enter relationships for our own pleasure, our own uh, fun, our own whatever. We want, here's what we want. We want low personal cost and high self-defined returns. Honestly, <laughs> that's so true, so true. But God wants high personal cost and high God-defined returns. That's what he wants. See, love, to be love is sacrificial. It's gonna cost you something. It just is. But that makes it all the more sweet, all the more meaningful when God gets us through to the other side. And so this conflict. Now, I want to talk about our struggle in God's agenda. Last part, we'll, uh, we'll touch on this last section, uh, verses 17 to 32. So I tell you this, says Paul, and insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. 
Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So Paul, what he does is really interesting. He identifies seven tendencies of the sinful heart. I want you to see what this is because they're so damaging to relationships, all right? And they're so disruptive of God's purpose that we have to live in the awareness, not defeated by these, don't be discouraged by this, become discerning of your own heart and become more grateful for what God gives us uh, to be able to deal with this. But ask yourself if this is evident in your relationships at home, at work, at church, in school, wherever. Seven tendencies of a sinful heart. Number one, the tendency towards self-indulgence. Verses 19 through 24, uh, Paul unpacked that quite in detail. But the bottom line is my behavior in the relationship is driven by what I want, not by God's purpose. Okay? Number two, the tendency toward self-deceit or toward deceit. Okay, verse 25 touches on that. I will manipulate the truth to get what I want out of the relationship. It's so subtle. You know, uh, these things are a little, it's kind of hard to swallow this because it sounds just so terrible and it is terrible. But understand, we don't think of ourselves uh, that way. Uh, because it's so that we have these habits and there's times we're just on autopilot. We're just responding back and forth in relationships and we don't even realize what's going on under the surface. Uh, it's the sin under the sin. There's the sinful words and actions, but what's motivating that? And sometimes there is this agenda in our hearts and, and we're, we can be manipulated. We want something badly and we're willing to sin to get it. The tendency toward anger it says, I want to control the relationship by venting my anger, by holding it over you to control you. In verses 26 and 27, talk about that. We touched on that a couple of weeks ago when I talked about this very verse and where it was back in the Psalms and how do we deal with anger. Uh, number four, uh, the tendency towards selfishness. Uh, verse 28 touches on that. I want to protect what I have rather than serve you. Notice that. Hmm. Rather than, he says, let him who steal, steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good. Why? That he may have something to give him who has need. A tendency toward unhelpful communication. Ooh, you know what? Next week, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about our talk. We're gonna deal with what this Bible has to say about our words. How, what's the grace God gives for us to have words that, that are good for one another and something that are glorifying to him? But the tendency toward unhelpful communication, rather than use my speech to make you feel better or put you in a better position, I speak to make myself feel better and ensure that I'm kind of in the top spot. I hope my wife's not here. She might jump up at this point and say... I got a story. Anyway, uh, the tendency toward division, uh, verse 31, I give in to temptation to view you. Listen, our, we view each other as the adversary. I see you as the enemy rather than seeing the enemy behind you. And, 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 and we're companions in this struggle. Do you see other people that you're struggling with as a companion in the relationship? By God's grace, particularly another believer, you're actually companions. You're on the same team. But do you see yourself that way or do you see them as your adversary? Um, the tendency toward an unforgiving spirit is the last one, verse 32. And so often we want to see people get what we think they deserve, make others pay for their wrongs, 
And we're all tempted in these ways. We're not immune as, as believers. But the amazing part of this passage is it also shows how God gives grace for every single one of those areas. That's why we need to move toward others, not run away from them. For example, in verses 20 to 24, how much wiser is God's plan for us than our plan for ourselves? Verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you've heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Put off concerning the former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Do you know one of the, the, the main ways we do that is what we're doing right now? We're being equipped in the word of God. Why? Because it renews our minds, it changes our hearts, it equips us for next time. We have that hard conversation. All of these things, that's God's grace. If, you don't have, if you're not equipped with the word of God and with the spirit of God, then, then you're just a sitting duck. You lose that spiritual battle every time. You don't know what to say or what to do. How much wiser is God's plan than ours? And then the life-changing power of truthfulness. I love that. The healing benefit of gentleness and patience and love. How many of you have been on the receiving end of someone else's gentleness and patience and love? Is it not true that that has a healing influence in your life? It may have even been somebody you couldn't stand them before. I mean, you were really struggling with them, but they, they took the higher road. They trusted the Lord. They were, they were good and kind and loving, and all of a sudden, it just, it's very disarming, isn't it? It's hard to go through life just so, you know, riled up and upset and angry when people are so good to you. And that's what we want more of in the body of Christ. The joy of serving the needs of someone else. Um, the value of loving and wholesome communication. Can't wait to talk about that next week. It's, it, it's such an encouragement to see. How, do we, how are we supposed to talk? How, how is it that we can change in those areas of our life? All of us fail in the area of words. I, I know that I sure do. I'm so thankful for God's word. Do you know the Bible says that it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks? And God does this work in our heart through his word that all of a sudden we start, we start speaking in different ways. The beauty of, of, of unity, verse 31. The freedom of practicing forgiveness. How important that is. Do you know it's interesting the word that's used here for forgive in verse 32? It's, it's different than most other places in the New Testament where it, it uses that English word forgive. In this place, if you were to do a word study, you would find that the, the root word of of our English word forgive here is the same Greek root word for the word grace. So when he says be kind to one another, forgiving, it's like gracing one another, even as God in Christ has had grace toward you. So Paul attaches grace to this concept of forgiveness. In other words, you don't wait till someone deserves it before you give it. A truth bomb just went off in some of your heads, I can see. <laughs> And, and you know, that happened to me when I learned that. I'll never forget the day that I learned that. I was withholding forgiveness from my sweet bride. I don't even remember what it was. It was probably something stupid and trivial, but I was pretty ticked off and, you know, and I was just waiting. Lord, when she comes and apologizes to me, I'll give it to her. I'll give her grace. And the Lord said, you sad, strange little man, come here for a minute. <laughs> And he took me to his word and he explained to me yet again, you don't understand, John. It's not how grace works. You know, and, and it just set me free. And so, uh, what vision for relationships is the Bible painting for us? Well, according to Ephesians 4, it's that the highest joys of relationship grow in the soil of the deepest struggles. I hope this is encouraging for you. I, you know, the danger of me addressing these hot potato issues is, you know, I always worry y'all are going to go, go, this is so heavy and so hard. I hope you don't. This stuff is thrilling to my heart. It sets me free. I am growing in these things just like you are. And I've struggled and I fail in all of these ways, just like you do. I'm telling you though, to the degree that there's any, any growth or maturity or victory in my life, it comes with having honest conversations with God and his word and with other believers. And, and all of a sudden, I just, I just start to think differently. And you know, I have a greater appreciation today for the, the, the difficult relationships in my life because I realize, you know, that's the soil where God 
is growing me up in his grace. It's that, that's the very soil. Every struggle is an opportunity to experience God's grace for yourself and to give it to another person. Isn't that amazing? What are the most meaningful relationships you have? Aren't they the ones that have lasted over time and have gone through the greatest difficulties? And by God's grace, you come out the other side. If you look at your own character, some of your, your, your deepest growth has been born out of great stress and trial. It's, it's just true. It's, it's part of the paradox of the Christian life. What do you want for your relationships, for your life? Do you want the same things God does? Do you have the same agenda? Okay, I have to stop right there. Our time's up for the teaching. The last thing that I want to do is I want to answer a question. Okay, you guys, I hope you're taking advantage of the little question cards and you write some, some questions to me. I've only gotten a handful of them each week, but I, I want to answer them, okay? And I'll be quick on this one as I can. And I'll give, I'm going to give you a partial answer. And then if you want, if you happen to have written it or if this prompts more questions, you want to come talk to me, please feel free to do so. But here's the question, okay? Is it wrong to just live together as a lot of people do nowadays? A member of another church told someone I know, you don't have to get married. You ever have that question? What about common law marriage? We love each other. We're committed. You know, what's wrong with it? Well, the question, so the, the, this is a like many folded question, but I'll make it simple. They said, what does the word say about this important matter? What's the, um, if some couples live together, what is the pastor's responsibility to advise them correctly? If they don't comply, should they be excommunicated from the church? Those are good questions. Okay, I'm gonna go through it real quick. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I want you to know, um, think of, when you think of, of, of a wedding, you think, or of a marriage, I, I think of the wedding at Cana of Galilee where Jesus was. You know what that story is? It's not what that story is about per se, but the fact that that story is in the Bible tells me something important that I think pertains to this question. Even Jesus acknowledged the societal norm at that day, which was legal marriage. And, and he affirmed it. And, and, and it's a public commitment. And it's a covenant with God, with, with, with one another, with families. And, and it, was a, it was something that was just part of culture at that time. We don't know exactly when, you know, certain things came into human uh, culture, but the Bible just acknowledges that it did. And so, uh, you know, these public legal ceremonies, that was the context also in which Jesus taught on divorce. It's the context in which he addressed sexual immorality. It was, it was assumed in those teachings that you are legally bound. You are spiritually and physically and emotionally bound up in this commitment. And, and so it was in that context that he said, now, so to divorce legally is wrong. To be just shacking up and sleeping together is wrong. You don't do that. And, um, and so there's these binding aspects to it legally and community-wise and spiritually. And, and it's why we make vows. I, I mean, the reason we make vows, for example, is because it's assumed that there's going to be times in your life when you're going to want to throw in the towel, you know, for better or for worse, in sickness and, he or, uh, in sickness and health, for richer or for poor, all these things. Isn't the underlying assumption that there's going to be times where the going is tough and you're going to want to just kind of look for greener grass? And there's something about this legal, public, binding commitment that sets the stage for a commitment that is essential if that marriage is going to be a picture of God's love. Because you know what? You're hard to love. And God doesn't walk away from you. You're hard to forgive. You're hard to serve. And I am too. And, God, and yet God did all of those things for us, didn't he? And he says, and marriage is a picture of my love. My commitment, my covenant, my grace, all of these things, you see? And I think usually when someone asks that question, and I, have, I absolutely have compassion for this, I have yet to meet even a single person who's asked that question who isn't asking it from a place of deep pain and sorrow and disappointment. They're asking it because 
there's been some life experience that has left them disillusioned with marriage. And they're trying to just kind of find a, a way around all the yucky stuff, and I just want the good stuff. And I understand that. I mean, who doesn't? But they're not looking at it from God's point of view. They're looking at it from their circumstances, from their own pain, their own experiences, their own feelings and thoughts about it. And they're trying to make sense of it. And there's a certain logic to it. There's a certain reasonableness to it when you only look at it from your point of view. What I'm saying to you, though, as Christians, we are to train ourselves to see things from God's point of view. And there's a purpose for marriage that, that has nothing to do with all the stuff that you bring attached to marriage. It's a picture of something eternal. It's a picture of, of, of Jesus and his holiness and his love and all of these kinds of things. And so, um, now, how do I answer this as a pastor? Well, I think I, I, I try to approach people humbly. I want to approach them honestly. There's a lot of things I have to talk with people about that, you know, if they only knew how much I'm shaking in my boots to say certain things because I know it's not going to be popular. And I, I know they're not, you know, I, I try to say it in a way that's not offensive, but sometimes God's word just offends because people don't want to hear it. But it doesn't mean we shrink back from speaking the truth. We speak the truth in love. I really try to discern what's, what's driving the question. And you should too, when you're talking to friends or family members or people about this, try to get under like, what, what's, behind, what's really behind this question? Because usually there's a lot of pain there and they do need understanding, they need compassion, they need prayer, they need tenderness and, and stuff. But, but that doesn't mean you compromise the word of God. We, we always speak the truth, but we do it in love. And, and then the question, if they don't comply, should they be excommunicated? Well, Again, if after all of this conversation and all I've laid out the biblical case and we've talked through what's really going on in their hearts, if that person just simply puts their foot down and says, well, I don't want to believe all of that and, and I don't care, well, that's just your opinion. Well, it's not just my opinion. It's what God's word says. And, and if they don't want to do that, it's, and this is true on any issue, not just this issue, then my ministry there is done. Well, what if they leave and you don't have a chance to minister to them? Well, I just did. My ministry is, is to be faithful to God and his word and to love people well and speak the truth, and that's your ministry too. And if in the process people don't want to hear it, and that's going to happen sometimes. Sometimes people, you know, they just, okay, uh, I'll go somewhere else. And you know what? They'll be able to find another church that will turn the blind eye. They'll be able to find another church, sadly, where sin is swept under the rug. All in the name of mercy and grace and tolerance. And, and, but you've got to remember the church and marriage is a, is a holy thing to God. And we don't never want to make a mockery of that. We need to be very tender hearted toward hurting people, but we're not doing people any favors, in my opinion, if, if we just kind of sweep sin under the rug. Remember, Jesus didn't do that. He died for it. That's far from sweeping it under the rug. And he understands people's pain. And so if someone, uh, the other thing is I want to know, are they a professing Christian? Now, if somebody's coming to church and they're doing that, hey, I want unbelievers to come to church and hear the gospel and hear the word of God and listen in on the Christian conversation because at some point they're going to have opportunity to respond to the gospel. If they're not a professing Christian yet, then I, will, I would continue to keep that door open for ministry and ask them to keep coming and keep asking questions. Let's keep talking about this. But if they're saying, I'm a Christian, I just don't agree with that, and I, we're going to keep doing it, then I, would, then I would have to, it's like with any other unrepentant lifestyle of sin, I'd have to say, well, you know what? We love you. I'm going to pray for you and uh, just entrust you to the Lord. But, uh, you know, I can't knowingly uh, allow that. Uh, because it stumbles other people. <clears throat> but, and, and Paul was pretty straightforward about that in Corinthians 5. He says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And, and he said, you want to always be seeking reconciliation with people, but not to the exclusion of this, this unity and this purity of his church. Does that make sense? So that's how I would respond to that. Let me read you just a small, a, a really quick excerpt of an excellent book. If you've never read Tim Keller's book, The Meaning of Marriage, listen to this. This is really good. Um, and this is just one aspect of the question, but I think it's worth reading. Um, he says, uh, <clears throat> I remember some years ago watching a television drama in which a man and a woman who were living together were having an argument over whether to get married. 
He wanted to go ahead and do it, but she did not. At one point, she blew up and said, why do we need a piece of paper in order to love one another? I don't need a piece of paper to love you. It only complicates things. That statement stuck with me because as a pastor in New York City, I've heard essentially the same thing from younger adults for years. When the woman said, I don't need a piece of paper to love you, she was using a very specific definition of love. She was assuming that love is, in its essence, a particular kind of feeling. She was saying, I feel romantic passion for you, and a piece of paper doesn't enhance that at all. In fact, it may hurt it. She was measuring love mainly by how emotionally desirous she was for his affection. And she was right that the marital legal piece of paper would do nothing, little or nothing directly to add to the feeling. But when the Bible speaks of love, it measures it primarily not by how much you want to receive, but by how much you are willing to give of yourself to someone. How much are you willing to lose for the sake of this person? How much of your freedom are you willing to forsake? How much of your precious time, emotion, and resources are you willing to invest in this person? And for that, the marriage vow is not just helpful, but it is even a test. In so many cases, when one person says to another, I love you, but let's not ruin it by getting married, that person really means, I don't love you enough to close off all my options. I don't love you enough to give myself to you that thoroughly. To say I don't need a piece of paper to love you is basically to say, my love for you has not reached the marriage level. One of the most widely held beliefs in our culture today is that romantic love is all important in order to have a full life, but that is that, that it almost never lasts. A second related belief is that marriage should be based on romantic love. Taken together, these convictions lead to the conclusion that marriage and romance are essentially incompatible, that it's cruel to commit people to lifelong connection after the inevitable fading of romantic joy. The biblical understanding of love does not preclude deep emotion. As we will see, a marriage devoid of passion and emotional desire for one another doesn't fulfill the biblical vision. But neither does the biblical pit romantic love against the essence of love, which is sacrificial commitment to the good of the other. If we think of love primarily as emotional desire and not as active, committed service, we end up pitting duty and desire against each other in a way that is unrealistic and destructive. I think that's really good. And um, like I said, it doesn't address every issue of this subject, but it, it, it hits the nail on the head in at least a couple of ways. So uh, let's stand together and we'll close in prayer. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. And thank you for um, just how... Lord, you know the needs of our hearts. You know the needs of each and every relationship. And Lord, we just pray that as we go from this place, uh, there's just something that would resonate with each of us that is edifying and helpful. Lord, I, I pray that um, your spirit would take the, the truth of what has been said and apply it to our needy hearts. And Lord, I pray that we would continue to be thankful for your grace and that we would be eager to pass on that same grace to one another. Lord, we in addressing the messiness of relationships, we don't want to focus on the mess. We, in talking honestly about our struggles, we don't want to focus on the struggle. We are just thankful that you have redeemed our lives completely and that all of these uh, things just drive us closer to you and deeper into understanding and living out grace. Uh, and we just love you, Lord, and we thank you. So encourage our hearts, equip us to grow and mature so that we truly reflect you. And we thank you for the diversity that we have. Thank you, Lord, for the unity that we have. We ask by your grace that we would also have the same agenda that you do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.